What's up? Hey, I know. Three months since last video, but now it's time to get practical with the project and I'll show you everything you need to know to operate the physical part of the inputs, the buttons of the keyboard. I'll start showing all my decisions on the circuit that I use to control, later on a little bit of the microcontroller side, I'll show you my design and how it works, and at least for the core part of the project, this will be the last hardware oriented part of the project because after this, we're gonna attach a DAC to the Mac controller and it'll be all softer. So hang on, this last hardware part and a little bit of electronics, a little bit of designing a circuit. I'm gonna show you a small part where I made a mistake and you can learn from that hopefully. And after that, we have a Mac controller attached to a keyboard so you can go directly to operate the sound. And after dealing with all these inputs, we can go design a sound engine and actually hear something out of a project. Let's go. So first, you gotta decide what architecture of the circuit will be, what topology you're gonna use to read all the inputs, and it's a lot of buttons to check. Remember, for each key, we have two buttons so we can measure the timing and thus read the speed in which we press the key. Of course, a lot of pins, and our microcontrollers usually don't have the number of pins. I know there are a lot of microcontrollers out there with a lot of GPIOs, but this is not the case. We're using the SP32 for its performance by price. So I found this great resource online, Open Music Labs, and I, I know I showed this link before, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through all the topologies that are presented in this site. I think it's an amazing compilation and I wouldn't do better. So I, could, I could do a presentation myself on all the kinds of inputs you could use, but this is already done, it's perfect for a ruse, so I'm gonna use this instead. So it opens up showing what is the key matrix, and I already talked about this, the diodes, the switches and all that. We can just jump to the important part. We have many ways to read buttons, but the main ones are you got a switch per pin, which is the dumbest but simplest to use. Then we can multiplex. We can charlieplex, which is I'm, I'm not gonna show you how to charlieplex. I think is way too specific and complex for this for my kind of video, which is basic tutorials. Then we have shift register. We are gonna use shift register in the future, but for reasons I'm gonna present to you. I'm not going to use for the keyboard and some other variations of, uh, of many uses to expand the number of IOs you can control with fewer pins. For some reason, the, the image won't load, but basically switch per pin is you got a button, connect to a pin, got a pull up or a pull down there and read the GPIO. This is by far the easiest way to implement it, but at the same time, it will cost you X number of pins, X being the number of keys you need. And we have 61, but two switches per pin, so we need 122 pins of the Mac controller, and we're using SP32, we don't have that much pins. So this technique won't work. Then you have the multiplexing, you have the multiplexing. This is how the keyboard is actually built. So it's meant to be multiplexed like that. You use a column and a row, it will power one and read the other and you can scan it. The diodes are there to prevent some glitches. We're gonna use basically this topology, but again, we have 61 keys, so 122 switches. And if you remember our Excel that I showed you in the last video, actually, let me just switch to it so you can remember. You have 16 pins for the rows. Of course, you have double the rows. So you got an eight by eight and have double the rows. We have 24 pins to control. That's a lot of pins and the ESP32 won't be able to deal with that. So we have to reduce the number of pins used to control our key matrix. So we're gonna use single multiplex here, but with a twist, we can reduce the number of pins. 24 is way too much. Just out of curiosity, in a future video talking about the other IOs, I'm gonna talk about buttons and dials and all that, you can use a shift register. It's basically a serial interface. You can use a clock and a data and we will latch up this data in all these pins. Then you can enable the outputs and all the data is synchronously set or reset. So this is really useful and really simple to use. Some of them of course are SPI or R2C, but you can do some that you can beat bang a GPIO and it will work and to, to some really high frequencies. All of our codes will be an interruption so it needs to be fast as possible. And for that, uh, shift to register is not the best use. So this is my final design. It already works, it's tested, so you can just build one too. So what is this? What am I doing? Well, I'm actually using the 24 bits to map the rows and columns of our keyboard matrix, but with one twist. I'm not using 
24 pins, of course. I'm using a MUX and DMUX, and instead of using 24 pins, I'm getting 8 and reducing by 3. Of course, that's binary. And I'm getting the 16 and reducing to 4. So we are switching 24 pins and we are going for 7. And I'm gonna explain to you if you're not too hot on electronics, I'm gonna explain to you this is this is really simple, really basic. What I'm doing here. Well, we have the first row and the second row. Remember to, to read the speed of the key press, you need two switches. So I'm gonna ignore this is for the same key, and I'm gonna read all of them as 16 rows, okay? And we have the eight columns. So you can multiply, you can see we have all the 122 switches here so I needed a 1 to 16 how do you do that well I chose to use 3 40 52 they have inside of them two 1 to 4 demuxes and I used two in parallel so I get 4 to 16 and I used the half of the third for 52 to make a 4 to 1 and of course I get it already in 5 volts I don't need a GPIO controlling that so in that way we are powering 16 rows of the keyboard matrix and all I gotta do is read the, the columns to find which key is pressed and for that I use another MUX right now making 8 into 1 and going into our load resistance if this is way much noise to you I can simplify the image there you go you can see it's basically we are scanning the rows and then scanning the columns and if you can do this fast enough, you have the illusion that we are mapping every single switch. I'm using already the 5 volts, it could be 3.3, depends on you. And just remember, I talked to you guys about simulating what were the perfect values for our load resistance. You guys remember the simulation, right? Yeah, I, I simulated what, what were the parasitic resistance of the keyboard. And we just came across this simulation, I basically modeled the internal resistance of the keyboard. And we got, remember, we're using three muxes in series. So we have this internal resistance all summed up. By the data sheet, the 4052 and 51, they have 75 ohms as internal resistance. Here I'm simulating the single switch. So we have a single diode and a single switch there. And then this 20 and 12.5 thousand ohms I got from modeling the voltage we got with different loads. And now that I got this model, I can actually make some curves to, to determine what would be the best load resistance. So this is the final result. So let me explain to you what is this. So this is the equation when you press the switch. So you have that 20 ohms resistor in the series of everything. And the final value of our voltage in the output is determined here by our load. So we have the voltage when you press the switch, you have the voltage with switch on. And this green curve here is the difference. Of course, everything here is in 5 volts reference. So what can we conclude? Well, the bigger the load, the higher the voltage when you don't press the key. So we have this curve. So F1 is the voltage you get in the output, depending on the resistance we use as a load. So here we have the higher the resistance, higher the voltage. And in the middle, the difference between the two curves. So what I want in my project, I want the black curve and the red curve as far as possible from each other, right? So we have, we have a big difference between on voltage and off voltage from the switch. So it's easy for us to read the value, right? So as you can see here, the difference starts to fall to zero, the higher you get resistances. The peak is in here. So I made this little inequation here to find where is the highest point of the green curve. And it's around here. This blue line here is 2.5, so it's half of the VCC. This is the part where the engineer can get creative and choose wherever he likes. I chose to use my load 1,800 ohms. It gets the biggest difference. And after that, of course, remember the circuit to have an op amp they're comparing. So in the end, we have ground or VCC voltage in the output. And of course, with all the modeling using an ideal value of diodes, 0.6 volts and around 10 ohms. Uh, I went by the data sheet to get that value. So the equations would be simpler to show, simpler to simulate, and I use the RL equal to 1.8 thousand ohms. Now it's just a matter of deciding which ESP32 pins you're gonna use. You can find in the internet which pins you can use as inputs, outputs, etc. So I'm gonna just skip that. If you have any questions, please comment down below. I'll be eager to answer all of them. 
and even make an extra video if you need. So now I have an RL, I have a topology, all I need to decide is which comparator to use. So I start with the basics. I tested the 741 and I tested also the 357. Both I had at my house, so I could just put on the protoboard and test to see if it worked. They didn't. They didn't work with 0 to 5 volts. They usually need a minus and a plus. I have such low voltage, nothing was working. I test the next op amp I had at home, the TL072, and it worked but it was too slow, at least with speeds I was switching everything. So I needed a specific op-amp to work in these conditions, and I got a specific one. So I got a proper comparator, TL712. This guy can compare with a lot of ranges, it's almost rail to rail and it's super fast. So we have that, what now? So my interruption was running and I was getting uh, some good timings. Remember, I always measure the time I need for a function using a GPIO, it turns on when the function gets in in the execution and it turns off and gets out, so it's basically a PWM, right? The longer it takes, you can vary that time, but the period of the interruption is always fixed. And then I got my oscilloscope to analyze the voltage out of the loads and I got some really weird spikes and this is the part I made a mistake. Oh, actually, I knew I was doing a mistake, but I keep on doing it because the idea of the project is to learn. So, what happened? Well, you can see when I press a single button, things get weird, right? Uh, instead of two pulses, because we're detecting a, a, a single key with two switches, it actually gets a lot of spikes. And what happened is, in my codes, I'm using some asynchronous output settings. So I was setting each pin every single time. So I detected which pin I needed. So I would set the first pin, the second pin, and the third pin for the columns or for the rows, whatever. And of course, instead of switching the whole circuit once and you reading the pin, I was just glitching it to the position bit by bit of the control. And that was a great mistake by my part, of course. And once I realized that, I tried to work around it without changing it so I could learn so I could learn the most about the mistake I made and how could I find a solution. Well, of course, the solution was to set and reset all the pins together using one function so we would read the register of the outputs, change the values and then set the register. Everything would work synchronously. But before doing that, I wanted to test how else could I fix this problem. And the solution one was to use gray code. Yes, yes, this gray code. The binary code in which only one bit flips each interaction. So basically stop my erroneous codes from switching more than one bit. So we got rid of those spikes and it actually worked. Before the solution to get rid of some small spikes that will sometimes appear, I used some resistors in the output of the MUX, let me show you. So I thought I had a problem with the MUX, maybe some parasitic capacitance. So I, I wanted to make sure it was not that. So I, I got some load resistance in the other side of the MUX just to really discharge that. Of course, it wasn't the case and I got sure of that, I scrapped the resistors and I realized it was only the switching and the final circuit still is what I showed you. This is the final version still, this is working perfectly, I just wanted to make sure nothing here was prone to glitch and it doesn't, uh, as far as you use synchronous output setting and resetting, okay? So you read the register once and output the register at once and everything will work fine if you're using a oscilloscope because our loop just sets the, the mux and the mux and after that it reads the gpio using for reading the output of the circuit so even if you get some glitches it wouldn't be a problem but that just means you have to use the same register and if you know esp32 i can make a video about esp32 like how can you use the registers to make things more efficient comment down below if you want help using esp32 i discovered a lot of tricks that made my life really really easier so basically you have two registers one to bits 0 to 31 and the other 32 i don't remember the max number of jpios but anyway i had to make sure that all the pins i used to control all the muxes here they were in the same register, so GPIO 0 to 31. So after I made sure I was using the right GPIOs, I connected everything, made the board. Let me show you the board. Do you guys remember this board? This is the same old board I'm using. And here you have all the MUX and DMUX. This is the multiplexer A21 that I'm using the output. And here, oh yeah, here. Here is the op-amp. 
So that's all you need to know to design your own circuits to control the keyboard. Uh, I'd like to have a way better presentation to, to show you guys and give you more details about it. But I'm in the middle of a really hard semester and it took a toll on me, on my body, on my sleep, on my energy. But I'm back and recording videos. I have already two more videos to present to you about how to make a digital DDS or the software part, the sound engine. And I'm already testing it. It's already working. Here you can see you have, you have the ESP32 hooked to a DAC. And I'm already making all crazy sorts of waveforms in there, so we have some really cool videos coming up. Of course, I almost forgot. We need a Finity State Machine to control if you press the key on and off to measure these timings. So the softer part, if you guys want, I can put in the next video. If not, I'm just skipping through it and going directly to the hardest part, which is the sound engine. I, I know a, a lot of you are not interested in the keys, you have MIDI keyboards. You want to make the, the hardest part, which is making sound. Just to show you a little bit of what I've done in software, this is basically testing if the if I press the key and which part of the switch was pressed, the first one or the second X or Y, and then it measured the times. And after that, it sends to the other core or other ESP if you're using dual boards. And after that, when you release the keys, it actually sends an off, so you can press, you have the timings, and you can cut the sound. You have the full ADSR envelope. And this is a improved version of my Fin State machine. All done in software, basically interruption with a switch, and then reads the state of the key and do some operations. That basically is software. If you guy needs anything on the software part, just, just comment down below, and I'll help you uh, the best I can. And that's it. Uh, I know this channel is being like dormant for the last months but i'm just doing my best to finish the last hard semester i have in college because after this semester that, that by the way ends in three weeks things will be way easier for me to make the videos that i like so much to finish this project and many other projects that i want to do but until these three weeks i'm gonna try my best to put some content out there but my priorities are finally finishing all the classes i have in college and no more classes to me thanks very much Unless, of course, I go into the Masters. But that, that's a maybe for the future. So I hope you guys got an idea of what I need to design to read the keyboard. If you have any doubts, any comments, please comment down below. I really like the feedback, although I'm tired as hell and my battery is really low right now. I will try to improve the content and, of course, answer every question you, you have about the design and about the programming part. I was about to show you in the next video how to use two ESP32s, but I made my code so efficient I actually won't need that. And basically what I did was, you can see this first ESP used for inputs and outputs, just that, one core to each task. And the other one to receiving the codes that are basically used to tell the other one which key was pressed and which config and send the data to the DAC. Well, what I did was I made this car run in one millisecond. I got rid of the UART part and now the peripherals and AM, FM, ADSR all run in the same loop, which is super fine, by the way. The ESP can, can deal with that with a really short time. And all these guys are run in one single ESP32 in the core zero, together with the keyboard interaction. And the main interruption, the one that runs the sound engine, is on the other core. And that's it. I'm going to use just one ESP32. So I'm going to be talking about uh, quad core here. <laughs> we'll be only using dual core, and that's just really enough for this project at least. So what I'm going to do with the next video is to teach you how to use dual core properly with really hard timings. Because the main idea of this project, of course, beyond dealing with music, I love music and sounds, is to learn to use RTOS. And not only free RTOS, but any RTOS. And one of the main concepts here is to use hard real time. So in the next video, I'm going to teach you how to use both cores with hard real time. And in the video after that one, I'm going to finally teach you how to build a DDS. That would be the architecture of the software you're going to use to generate sounds. Yeah, I've not been updating a lot of videos in this channel, but I've been working really hard on the project and on my three classes and many other stuff. So I already have those scripts ready. I just need to record them. And I'm trying not to exhaust myself on these videos because I need energy to finish my semester properly. So stay tuned if you're interested in how to use the dual cores 
of the ESP32 using only C, no Arduino framework, and after that how to build a DDS sound engine. Thanks again for watching my videos, I hope you're actually liking and learning something. The more this project goes on, no demand synth or addictive synthesis as I like to call it, the more interesting the videos are getting, so stay tuned, things are going to get really nice, really interesting. Now leave your comments down below, I hope you liked this video, the next ones are going to be really nice, and I'll see you there. Bye bye!